Uh, for you, well, let me get, let me get in this camera, right? Okay. okay. <laughs> My name is Ken Walsh. Uh, I'm an engineer before everything else. Uh, my master's is, uh, my, my bachelor's in electrical engineering, my master's in ocean engineering. I worked at the Navy lab for 43 years. And when I retired in 2002, I went back to school and uh, studied history and economics. And I got a PhD. So uh, I spent two years uh, looking at Newport's history, and particularly from an economic standpoint, which is, turned out to be very interesting. Uh, had a thriving international economy. Uh, turns out that the farms on this island and the adjacent island, you know, Hog Island, Goat Island, like that, um, were very productive, twice as productive as any of the farms on the mainland, mainly because the predators couldn't get to these farms, right? Uh, and if a, a wolf or another predator managed to get to the island, he got hunted down and gotten rid of, right? So the island farms were twice as productive as the mainland. That gave them something to sell. They started selling up and down the coast and down to the Caribbean. Uh, it turned out that there were three major ports at the beginning of the American Revolution. Halifax in Canada, right? Newport and New York, right? The problem with New York was that the water was too shallow uh, to get in there with major warships. Uh, the British, in order to shut down the trade, occupied Newport from 76 to 79. And the prevailing opinion was that this action by the British, which did depress the economy here severely, uh, put a permanent crimp in the uh, Newport economy and it never recovered. It turned out to be not so. Uh, I say I'm an engineer. If I if I went in and said you got to have more samples on a, on a set of data uh, because of the Nyquist criteria, everybody would say, "Huh, not good." So what I did is I put this quote in, and now most people uh, recognize the. Uh, Arthur Conan Doyle, a study in Scarlet, the first of the, of the uh, Holmes novels, right? And he has Holmes saying, it is a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. It biases the judgment. Uh, a lot of the contemporary literature, they didn't bother checking. So we went in and we checked. Uh, Use the local records. You go to the Historical Society in Newport, what you'll find is the tax records going back all the way to 1772. So you can, say, you can see who's paying taxes and whatever. Uh, there was an industrial revolution in Providence in the um, late 1700s. Slater Mill started it, and it went on from there. And then what that did, it produced uh, a phenomenon called creative destruction. Uh, what happens is that some new product comes along, all the buyers shift from the old product to the new product. People who are making the old product go out of business. Right? So, uh, and what happened was that Newport had to shift from uh, a mercantile eco economy to a uh, tourist industry and then basically to what we've got now. Uh, founded in, uh, yeah, the colony was founded in 1639 and uh, Newport was, uh, was uh, set up the following year. We got a charter. Rhode Island was the only non-secular state in the world when, it w when that charter was passed. It was signed by the king. Right? The only place you could go where you couldn't, the, the, the legal structure could not make laws regarding religion. Okay? And because of that, <laughs> all the, the uh, non-conformists ended up in Rhode Island <laughs> because they were thrown out of every place else. A uh, couple of examples, Aaron Lopez uh, was a refugee uh, from uh, Portugal. Uh, he came with his family uh, about, and then uh, Tom Robinson was a Quaker, right? neither of which were very welcome anyplace else. When uh, 
Lopez went to, with his family, went to New York from Portugal because they had relatives in New York City. Right? Uh, <laughs> founding fathers in New York said, we don't want you guys here, right? He said, go to Newport, they'll take anybody, right? So they went to Newport. Aaron Lopez became the richest guy in Newport in 1775. Excellent merchant. Uh, Newport became the major commercial center for the East Coast in, by 1760. Uh, they were trading with England for manufactured goods. Uh, they were trading them with produce. Take the manufactured goods and trade them, trade down to the Caribbean for uh, uh, sugar, molasses, uh, make rum, trade that to, the, to Africa, back to the Caribbean, and then back up here for more uh, rum. Uh, in terms of religious freedom, in uh, 1659, two Quakers, well, three Quakers from here went up to Boston. Uh, and they, two of them uh, were men, one woman, one woman, Mary Dyer. The two men were tried and hung. Mary Dyer came back to Newport. Following year, she went back up to Boston, and they <laughs> tried her and hung her too. So it was very dangerous outside this colony for anybody who didn't toe the line on whatever the state religion happened to be. Colonial merchants traded with England due to economics and advantages. Uh, when it was profitable, they bypassed the British laws. The, the British law said that if you trade with a foreign country, like the Dutch or the French or the Italians, right, you had to stop in England before you came home right, and pay your taxes. Right? Colonials said, ah, you know. And the problem was that it was too costly for the British Navy to effectively, you know, stop the trade. Uh, and, the, and the results was a general disrespect for the English law and customs service. Uh, Charles II uh, named this Edward Randolph as a surveyor of taxes. They sent him over to see what was going on. Randolph, uh, the, the, the courts, the governor, and all the inhabitants supported the, uh, or obstructed the British customs collectors and s supported the uh, smugglers. Uh, Randolph's comment, no thing, was that neither law nor, <laughs> neither law nor government in Newport, right? And the city had become a major port where there was much illegal trade. Uh, in Newport, uh, the courts, were used to harass the government customs officials. Right? In many cases, a smuggler was caught. Right? They, uh, before they could bring him to trial, the evidence disappeared, the witnesses disappeared, and the guy was found not guilty. Right? <laughs> if a customs inspector crossed the line, he was tried and convicted <laughs> immediately. <laughs> Speedy justice. Right? Uh, Documentary evidence was sent to the British uh, Customs Service to England uh, by you know, describing the infamous practices of the colonials. Uh, the use of bribery and fraudulent papers and a highly effective way of evading the English law. Uh, up until 1760, Newport's economy was unconstrained. Nobody, nobody could keep track of it. Matter of fact, uh, the, uh, well, Navigation Acts, but uh, before 1763, the Navigation Acts provided a workable system. It, if it was profitable, they'd go to England. I mean, you know, if it wasn't, they'd just bypass England and not worry about them. The shipping events were set up in tables. You, the way you could get and find out what the shipping events were is you go to the newspaper and uh, the Custom House posted uh, which ships were ca came in, which ships would go out, and where they were coming and going from. And uh, uh, you can see the sloops and uh, the uh, destinations. So one of the things you got to watch out for, when you're, when you're reading these uh, old newspapers, the first 
letter that it looks like an F, it's really an S. If you look in this list, you get uh, Turk Island and Newcastle, and uh, this right here. That that's an S, right? Not an F. All right now. Here are the destinations of the shipping between uh, 1762 and 1763. If you look at this, you can see that most of the commerce was local, right? You had 494 ships in local trade. Uh, to the Caribbean, you had 133 ships trading back and forth to the Caribbean. In the whaling, you had four. Nova Scotia had 15. What they were doing in Nova Scotia, the, the Brits would ship manufactured goods to Nova Scotia. These guys would go to Nova Scotia and pick up those trade goods. Now, 12 going to Africa. The only reason they were going to Africa is in the slave trade. Okay? So out of some 600 ships coming and going, only 12 were, were in the slave trade. This is some of the routes. In the slave trade, they would go this way. And, and they were trading not only for slaves, but for gold. This is the Gold Coast, right? Uh, and they come back around through the Caribbean and back and forth to England, back and forth this way. These are the types of ships used. Most of the ships were sloops of brigs. Some of them were a little larger. They would trade fish, grain, meat, lumber, whale oil, ships, tobacco. Uh, trade with the West Indies with slaves, fish, uh, trade goods, lumber, livestock. Uh, the King of England forbade the export of horses from England because he was afraid he wouldn't have enough horses for his cavalry. Right? When he did that, all the Newport people who were raising horses started trading quick with the Caribbean because the price went up. Right? Uh, this gives you a list of things that were advertised for sale in the, uh, in the Newport paper. Uh, the colony of Surinam is a Dutch colony on the north coast, and uh, they also hunt their wheels on the Falcons. Now, this is a picture that was painted uh, of a tavern scene uh, by uh, uh, where is he? John Greenwood, right? Now, you got Cook, you got Isaiah Hopkins, Stephen Hopkins, and Joseph Wanton. <laughs> Nobody liked him, right? Is the guy gonna pull a punch on his head and he's, he's passed out from drinking too much and this guy's throwing up in his pocket, right? Now, it turned out that he's a Tory, and when the Newport was occupied by the British, they made him the chief high sheriff. <laughs> right? So he was not well liked. This picture, by the way, you can get off the web. Uh, the St. Louis Art Museum has it posted. Now, the uh, price of molasses on the French islands and the Caribbean was half the price it was on the British islands. Okay, so the big advantage of trading with the French islands, right? All right, one of the techniques for justifying trade with the islands, under flag of truce, right? What they would do is they would take one Frenchman and a shipload of cargo and go down and trade with the French islands. The other method they would do is they would sail into one of the Spanish islands, put a Spanish crew on the boat, have the Spanish crew take it into the French island and do the trading, all right? Uh, at one point, uh, the, uh, the little town of Monte Cristo uh, was on, uh, on the north coast of um, Hispaniola. It was right next to the border of what is now Haiti, it was a French colony. And they would go to that port and meet the French ship there and they would trade. They wouldn't even take the stuff ashore, they would just haul back and forth by boat. Uh, Aaron Lopez, richest man in Newport in 1775. Okay, uh, he had a farm in Portsmouth. 
Right? He purchased the farm in 1758 on the corner of Brayman's Lane and Wap or near Brayman's Lane and Wapping Road. It's on Wapping Road and uh, the road that goes down to the winery. If you go, you want to go look for the lot. Uh, had a farm, a farmhouse and a barn, and easy access to the Sakonet. Right? The claim to fame for this farm was that you could bring boats into the Sakonet unload on the beach below the farm, haul the stuff up the road, store it in the farm, and take it into Newport as if it came from Boston, right? And uh, uh, what Lopez did on at least one occasion, because we sort of let him, uh, he wrote a letter to the Dutch merchants, had the Dutch merchants ship their uh, order to the Dutch colony, Suriname, on South, South America. No taxes, right? He was in a sloop down, pick the stuff up, bring it back up into the river, load it in the farm, and then down into Newport. Right. Is Brayman's Lane, is the whopping, this is the road going down to the beach. And uh, uh, this is such uh, well known to the British that when uh, <coughs> uh, Lieutenant Fage drew his map, they named the bay Lopez Bay, right? And they actually took over his farmhouse and made a fortress out of it. Now, George III uh, took over after George II died in his water closet. The guy was 77 years old. He died sitting on the, his throne in his water closet. And uh, his uh, grandson took it over. George III. Now, the Seven Years' War in Europe was the French and Indian War here. Uh, it was basically, that, that turned out to be the root cause of the American Revolution, if you believe that. William Pitt, uh, fighting the French, doubled the English national debt, right? When he died in the water closet, his grandson, George III, took it over. George III wasn't interested in the war. He didn't like Pitt either. And uh, he replaced the uh, Earl of Butte above him. Uh, he ne George III negotiated an easy settlement of the, of the uh, Seven Years' War with the French and left them in an economic condition with, where they could provide financial and military aid to the colonies. Right? The enemy of your enemy is your friend, right? So, anyway, the success of Britain in the Seven Years' War made them overconfident. Pitt's expenditures during the Seven Years' War, as they doubled the British national debt, the objectives of the British government after the Seven Years' War was get the Canadians under control. Now, they got Canada from the French. Uh, France didn't want Canada. Canada was a money sink, right? Uh, and uh, they were trying to get the Canadians under control. They wanted to get the colonies to cooperate, right? That's us. And the colonies to pay the cost of the defense, right? Right here is where the revolution started. When they started to try to make the colonies pay the English national debt. Newport was under control of a group of major merchants. The merchants controlled the international trade and the local trade. They corrupted the British government officials and performed a prodigious amount of smuggling. Right? The customs officer's salary was 100 pounds a year, which is about uh, 480 Spanish dollars. Okay? Now, customs official was making over 6,000 Spanish dollars a year under the table from the merchants, right? So you, you can guess who the size he was on. <laughs> right? The major merchants formed the backbone of the Newport economy. Members in this group in 1775 paid about $10 each in taxes and had about 70-70% of the wealth. These people fit the description of barbarians, well, blonde smell. Uh, they were aggressive traders. Uh, they really had a clear idea of what they wanted to do. They wanted to make money, profit, right? And that, that drove the whole setup. Now, 
taxes on a, on a uh, basis for, this I think was done in 1772. Right? Merchants paid $24, Spanish dollars. Farmer was 16, distiller was 11, comptroller and like that down the line. And <coughs> until you get to a ship captain, he didn't have any property. This, these are property taxes. Right? <coughs> he may have had a house on a postage stamp lot in Newport, so he didn't pay much. Uh, farmers, merchants, and distillers pay the most of, for their uh, ta of taxes. They accumulated most of the wealth and property, and they paid most of the taxes. Eh? Uh, <coughs> the Newport tax base was pretty stable between 72 and 75. You can see the sort of overlay. Uh, <coughs> the um, uh, taxes were property tax. Uh, whenever they had a project they had to do, they would figure out how much it was going to cost, and then they would divide it up proportionally among all of them. Newport citizens. Most of everybody in Newport paid taxes. The, the value, the mean value of uh, <coughs> in Newport of the town was about a little over a million Spanish dollars. And plus or minus about 200,000 when you're trying to do these estimates. That's an important number. It turns out because that's, that's the number we use to see whether or not Newport recovered after the revolution. Uh, Boston was closed. Bunker Hill was fought. 1775, 2,000 people out of 5,000 were smart enough to leave Newport. The only people they left behind were the Tories, who were the guy, the guy that was getting punch on his head and vomit in his pocket. Now, uh, Lopez moved up to a small town in Massachusetts. Joseph Anthony moved to Pennsylvania. And I say 2,000 people left for better places. Uh, Port of Boston was closed at, uh, in the wake of the Boston Tea Party. Guess where all those merchants went? They went to Newport. Uh, the, uh, by the way, when the British tried to take Bunker Hill, uh, they learned a hard lesson, right? They lost 47%, 48% of their troops trying to take Bunker Hill. And the reason for it was that the colonials hid behind the stone walls and didn't stand up straight, and they just shot these guys as they come up the hill. The second thing they did was that they shot the officers first, right? Uh, in the British Army, uh, the, the troops are cannon fodder. They are from the low class, that don't count for anything. The officers are from the noble class, usually, and they provided all the direction. <laughs> Once the officer was dead, the, these guys just milled around, right? So, uh, Bunker Hill, General Sullivan, the, the only reason they didn't lose more was that Sullivan ran out of ammunition. <laughs> Okay. Uh, in an article published in the Newport Mercury in August of 1775, uh, it, it was a letter, it was published, it was sent from Britain uh, to uh, the brethren, quotes, uh, the Quakers, right? And it says they would be slaughtered by a large fleet and army that was being ready to sail against them. That was one of the that was one of the things that prompted the 2,000 people to leave Newport. Right? The, uh, <coughs> the Rose Swan and the Kingfisher uh, made preparations to cannonade Newport, but they never did. Uh, they went to Jamestown and burned a bunch of buildings in between the East and West Ferry. Uh, the Rose and, an, uh, and a, uh, another armed schooner attacked Prudence Island, but there wasn't anybody there. They, I think they wrecked a windmill. And Prudence Island had already been evacuated. Now, of the three ports, right, Halifax, the British had, Newport, they occupied. They shut down the port. And then New York, they had, right? 
that picture was taken of British reenactors on Siege Day in uh, seven, uh, 1978. <laughs> no one's going to see 1778. But uh, British arrived. 6,000 regulars, half British, half Hessian, uh, closed the port, martial law, no civil government, military courts were used for everything. All right? uh, people who spoke up <laughs> against the British were thrown in, in the prison ship. Uh, no freedom of speech. British collected all the firearms, no right to bear arms. Right? Now, <clears throat> when you look at the, the Bill of Rights, you can, you can tell who is lobbying, right? We had personal experience in Newport as to what happens when you get a, uh, an army in there to suppress you. These are forts along the top of uh, Portsmouth. Uh, Howland's Ferry is out here going out to uh, Tiverton. Uh, Bristol Ferry is here. Uh, Lopez uh, Farm was uh, made into a fortress. Uh, the Elms was made into a fortress. What they would do is take the house and they would raise a dirt wall around it and uh, the dirt wall would be thick enough and high enough to protect them from small arms fire and some light cannon. Right. Now, Benjamin Franklin negotiated a treaty with the French uh, for mutual aid. Right? The first item under the, the treaty, uh, the King of France sent uh, Admiral d'Estaing and the Toulon fleet here to help out. Right? Uh, he went down to Sandy Hook to try to attack the, the, the British uh, fleet that was down there under Admiral Howe. Turned out that his ships had a 25-foot draft, big ships, lots of guns. Right? The water was only 15 feet deep, right? so he couldn't get at them. Eventually, he and Washington, uh, going back and forth, Washington said, go to Newport, deep water port, and help General Sullivan remove the British. So he comes up to, to um, Newport, talks to General Sullivan, and the plan was he was going to land his troops uh, on the west coast near Dyer Island. Sullivan was going to attack across from Fogland Ferry, and they were going to make a pincer movement and cut off the, the troops in the north part of the island. Well, General Pigot, who was commanding Newport, uh, had made a... Uh, a decision that if the French got into the bay, he was going to pull all his troops back down to the Newport and leave nobody up on the north end of the island. So what happened was that's what he did. He pulled all his troops back and he got this defensive line. This is the interior, internal line, right? Uh, he had built, and then he pulled all his troops back and built this line. And he built this line while the colonial troops were trying to get their way down the, down the island. This is, this is cards we dealt. Uh, this is where the colonials were up on Honeyman Hill eventually. They came around this way. Uh, <coughs> Siege did little damage to Newport. Most of the action took place off of Valley Road in Middletown. And there was a rear garden in Portsmouth that covered the withdrawal in the end of August. Uh, the French fleet came into the bay. And as they came into the bay, it had a gunfire cannon duel with uh, the shore batteries the British had set up. Uh, British didn't do any damage, and uh, apparently the colonials didn't do much either. I mean, the, British, the French didn't do much damage either. Uh, again, English forts, this is Greenland going out, this is the colonials coming down, this is Valley Road. Now, 1779, uh, the, the British High Command in, in New York decides that all these guys sitting up in Newport aren't doing any good to anybody, right? except they're making a target of themselves. So they recalled them. In 1779, they recalled all the British out of Newport down to New York, and they were going to use them in campaigns in the southern colonies. 
Now, the British weren't really interested in uh, New England. New England was basically a competitor to England, right? Uh, but uh, they were interested in the southern colonies because that's where they got their cotton for the cotton industry. So they were, they were going to pull them out and, and work them down there. So what happened in 1780, Russia boat comes uh, with another uh, French fleet, land, and they, they, they come and buy Newport, no English, right? So they pulled into Newport and uh, set up. They had uh, quite a few uh, sick because of scurvy, and they had to have them here and let them recover. Uh, this is a map that was drawn for Russian bow showing the French installations. <laughs> and the uh, interesting part about that is that <coughs> it tells you here which ones are which, and all numbered, right? Turned out the French built three new forts and then rebuilt the English forts that were made in this exterior defense line that we were looking at. And so uh, the other thing they did uh, <coughs> well, this goes, shows you what we were just doing. Um, and uh, <laughs> Count de Rochambeau was in charge of the, of the army. Brendan House is where he had his headquarters when he was here. You can see, you go down, you can look at the plaque on the wall. Uh, these are on Washington Street. Uh, and uh, they were locations where uh, uh, the French military had uh, the sub headquarters. Uh, the French and the local militia built uh, up all these forts. Uh, they positioned the French warships in the harbor to defend Newport against a British counterattack. Russian will left a detachment of French uh, military, which combined with the colonial militia, defended Newport for the rest of the, the war. Uh, Rochambeau brought money, right? <coughs> the, the French government had given Rochambeau a large quantity of silver <coughs> that he could spend to buy troops, buy food for his troops and like that. The most important thing for Newport's economy was that the, the ships brought money and customers. <laughs> Right. You can look at the Newport newspaper in this time era. They had advertisements written in French trying to sell stuff to the French soldiers. Right? Anyway, uh, Chaplin <coughs> was one of the uh, merchants that left Newport, but he didn't go very far. He went over to uh, Narragansett and, and stayed out of the way. When the when the uh, English left, he came back. And he got between the French military and the local farmers, because he knew everybody, right? And he started making money, right? He used his money to purchase a ship and got into the Far East and Baltic trade. Right? Uh, John Gibbs and Walter Channing came back and they reestablished their trading firms. And uh, Gibbs and Channing merged their businesses in 1793. And by 1800, they owned seven 300-ton ships, one 600-ton ship, three brigs, and like one schooner. So Newport's reestablishing its sta uh, status as a merchant community. Now, this is the worth of Newport <coughs> based on the tax returns. 1775, we figured the place was worth a million and some. It lost half its value. Uh, when the 2,000 people left, right? The British ruined whatever was left, and uh, by the time the French arrived, uh, the value of the material in the town was like half of what it was before. 1782, the economy is growing like a weed, right? 15% per year, right? uh, and you get down in here, 1796, you, you, the town is worth more than it was here. Right? 
1801, it's with this, and when you look at the growth rate, this is about where it would be if uh, there had been no war, and it was growing at a nominal one to two percent. Right, now, I worked for the federal government for 43 years. I know what it's like. I, it wasn't good to these folk. Uh, between 1801 and 1812, there were four groups with four different agendas. The French under Napoleon was trying to take all of Europe. The English were trying to stop the French. The United States wanted the British out of the Americas. Uh, 1803, we bought the Louisiana Purchase, okay? The British are selling guns to the Indians and ammunition through Canada, right? And uh, they wanted them out of there. And uh, so the people in the Congress were predominantly southern large landowners, okay? and southern politicians, and they wanted to expand westward their, their, their states, right? And uh, so anyway, the merchants in Newport were doing a good business because they were neutrals, right? And they were selling stuff to everybody and having a good time. Uh, the British were impressing seamen, right? Now, a British seaman was making something like seven dollars and fifty cents a month okay a, U, a u.s merchant seaman at the time was making 17 to 18 dollars a month right you can guess where those british sailors wanted to go work right now what they would do uh the british would stop a ship and say hey that guy looks like he's english and grab him right All right so say so you had a crew of five they would take one, you had a crew of four, they would make port, and they would hire a seaman, right? Who was probably a British deserter <laughs> coming back to work for the merchants. Uh, the British Royal Navy had 600 cruising warships, including uh, 175 ships of the line. They needed a lot of people, and it was not a, uh, a job they could easily recruit to. Uh, Nelson wiped out the French Navy, basically. They, after, he took, he, he beat the French in Egypt, he crushed the Danish fleet, and then, uh, and before, and then he went to Trafalgar and to, got rid of the Napoleon's remaining forces. So, after that date, the British controlled the ocean. Uh, Americans were making a lot of money. Uh, it, it was stealing the British commerce, right? The British were involved, were involved in this war, but the Americans had come in and go and trade with it or whatever. Now, by 1811, uh, the merchant marine fleet expanded from uh, half a million tons to almost a million tons, double. Uh, they needed sailors for the ship. They recruited from all uh, countries. They were paying sixteen, eighteen dollars a month for able body compared to the British, who paid seven. Uh, the British claimed that at least twenty thousand British subjects deserted the navy to serve in the American merchant marine. The American estimate was about nine thousand. Uh, the justification. But the War of 1812 for the U.S. government was that this enslavement of white American seamen on British ships, right? The driving motivation, however, was the intended expansion westward into the Louisiana Purchase, and the British was selling guns to the Indians. True objective of the War of 1812 was to attack Canada and remove the British from the Americas. Not the Navy, or not the ships, right? But that. And uh, Congress tried to stop U.S. goods from reaching Britain. The Embargo Act of 1807 and the Non-Intercourse Act of 1809. Disaster for Newport. Shut it down. Right? We couldn't trade with foreign ports. There goes our merchants. Now, 
The British weren't injured at all. They obtained their food by trading with South America. They found new markets for their manufactured goods in South America. British ships took over the, the maritime trade that the American ships had, had been stopped. Uh, in addition, the United States discharged the British-born sailors they could no longer employ. Yeah. They all went back to work for the British. Uh, it was a windfall for the British and a, and a ruined American trade. Uh, the other thing was that normally the uh, goods from the Midwest would come through like to Newport and Newport would trade them out to the uh, Europeans. Well, you got all these guys, Newport couldn't ship, right? So what they did is they moved the uh, goods to the Canadian border. The Canadian merchants had a field day. Uh, the American exports and imports dropped from 114 million in eight to 20 million, right? Down by a factor of five. Uh, government revenue dropped to 13 million, uh, from 13 million to 6 million, even though the tax rate was doubled. Right? Uh, the senior merchants in Newport were reaching the end of their lifespan. Uh, what had happened, uh, Slater Mill, uh, up in Pataka, uh was started up. Uh, you started to have a, an industrial revolution happening in Providence area, right? So the merchants in the Providence area didn't have to go to England to get their manufactured goods. They got them right there, right? And they could trade them at a, uh, a savings in com uh, compared to the uh, Newport merchants, and they competed very aggressively. Uh, the other thing, you know, the other thing that's happening is that so there's no new, there's no new investment in Newport shipping, right? Uh, it's being invested up in Providence. Uh, George Gibbs died in 1803, and um, at the time, Gibbs was the, the highest taxpayer. It's George Gibbs, and what's happening? And look at these dates. These are the the major. Newport taxpayers in 1801, and look at when they're dying, all right? So by, the, by 1820, there's one major taxpayer left alive, right? Everybody else is dead, and their businesses are, are coming apart. Uh, Channing announced that he was going to uh, take, uh, take over the partnership of Gibbs and Channing. Uh, he continued to operate after George Gibbs died and then dissolved as of that day and became also Channing Incorporated. Um, top 10 taxpayers in 1793, nine had died before the end of the War of 1812. The 10th is James Robinson died in 1817 at the age of 79. So you can see the whole uh, mercantile structure of Newport just collapsing. Uh, by 19, 1820, uh, of the nine that survived, three more died. The other five major, um, five minor merchants, and one major merchant is Thomas Dennis to rebuild Newport. And what happened was, uh, well, if you look at Samuel Whitehorn, right? His house is down on Thames Street, right? He and his brother were partners in a distillery, right? Uh, the pro and he was a junior partner in the distillery. He's a good administrator. He ran the merchant bank. He imported molasses and sold some of it at retail, and uh, still likely in the safe slave trade. Uh, it is likely that he was taking rum to Africa and slaves to some of the islands in the Caribbean that were still doing that and then uh, coming back up with molasses. He went bankrupt. Uh, he lost a couple of ships and he went bankrupt in 1844. That's the house he built on Thames Street. Uh, 
up until about 1807, they were still operating at a profit, even in the, uh, the adverse trading environment, mainly because of the costs were up so high. Uh, 1815, the harbor, uh, after the War of 1812, uh, the harbor was wrecked by a hurricane, and uh, the Portsmouth Tivet and Bridge was wiped out. Uh, had there been no more changes, Newport might have recovered. However, the Industrial Revolution in Rhode Island Center in Providence brought big changes. After 1815, this is what's going on. Here's, here's Providence here. Here's Newport. You can see building up 1780, uh, this is where the British occupied it, dropped it down, and it starts building up again. Now, right about here, steam engine in the US takes off, Providence takes off. Newport continues on at the same growth rate. Okay, this is this increase in here. The railroads, the steam ships, uh, Providence became a big manufacturing center for steam engines. Uh, they were building railroad engines, all kinds of things. And during the Civil War, the merch, the uh, woolens manufacturers in the northern part of the state made a fortune. They produced most of the woolen uniforms for the, for the uh, United States Army. And uh, they were doing quite well. Uh, <coughs> we ended up with four mills in uh, Newport. Two were woolen, two were cotton. Uh, the woolen mills burned down. The cotton mills are still there. Uh, this is Perry Mill, which is on the corner by the post office downtown, and that's uh, Quiddick Mill, which is um, a little further down Thames Street on the right-hand side. Uh, 1836, Newport had mills producing both cotton and woolen cloth. It's Warwick and his Newport. You can see, 1809, he had six, 12, 11, 13, 29. We had four in 1840. So, and the reason for that, by the way, is that we don't have any rivers on the island, none that are worth anything. Uh, I grew up in Winsocket. You had the Blackstone River coming down. They used that to power the mills and to provide water for washing the cloth and all that. So the northern part of the state is growing like a weed. Uh, banking capital. Here's Newport going along. Look at, this is in millions. Fifteen two hundred eight million dollars in banking capital. What's so happening to the slave trade? What what what? what does, oh, slave trade. Understood it build up then. Long gone. Um, the last guy we know that was in the slave trade was um, Whitehorn, and he was in a, in a very low level. The the slavery got you know outlawed in Newport, and all the slavers went to uh, Bristol. <laughs> They operated out of Bristol for a while. Uh, the economics of the slave trade are interesting because what would happen is that they would take the rum and other goods from here, t trade it to Africa, pick up the slaves in Africa, take them to the Caribbean, and that loop gave them a factor of 10 increase in value. Okay? So the, the slavers in that loop made a lot of money. Uh, they they increased their, their profits by a factor of 10, right? But most of the, uh, the economy was not the, the slave trade per se, it was you know, trading goods back and forth up and down the coast and like that. And um, there were 22 distillers down on Washington Street, down in that area. And uh, uh, I read a, um, a report from one of the town council meetings in Newport uh, that uh, said that you know these people were complaining because a, a a woman of good virtue could not walk down Washington Street without getting dis drunk from the distiller fumes, and they were complaining because of the air pollution. Right. So, uh, but uh, the uh, this the slave trade became you know very. Um, inconsequential after 
you know, this time. They, they say that the DeWolf's toes were cleaning up right up to the Civil War. The oh, yeah. Family up there. But he was up in Bristol. Yeah. Yeah. They kicked, them, they kicked all the slave traders out of Newport. When, when did oh. that happen? Oh, shoot. Um, it was before the War of 1812. I forget exactly when they, when they, uh, they, they outlawed the slave trade in Newport. It didn't stop Whitehorn. Whitehorn was trading uh, in that loop up until like 1844, but from what I understand, he was the only one left. And, the, and he was doing it because they needed molasses for their distillery. By the way, most of the rum from the distilleries in Newport were trading up and down the coast. I think they said uh, two-thirds of the rum was drunk in the colonies, right? and a third of it was used in the trade. Yes. Yeah. The thing that put the finish to the Newport trading was the railroad. Uh, they built a railroad coming up from New York along the coast, up through Providence, up to uh, uh, Boston. And uh, the coastal trade out of Newport depended on picking up produce along the way and selling it in New York and back, vice versa. Now, when a train was there, train does 30 miles an hour, what does the sailboat do? Train arrives on time, the sailboat's, you know, stuck with the wind and whatever. As long as the sailboat was the only mode of transportation, Newport was doing pretty good. When the train came along to compete with them, it, it uh, ruined the coastal trade. Uh, Newport business, basically 1811, when Channing retired, it folded up. Cloth mills established in here. Uh, railroad ship and shipyard. Uh, it, the Newport shipyards were making wooden ships for the coastal trade. When the coastal trade went away, they got in a lot of trouble. Uh, they did some whaling, uh, farming and fishing. Uh, there was an international depression in 1857, which uh, hurt a lot of these businesses. Um, and it's the same map, the same basic thing we saw. The War of 1812, you can see the expansion. Uh, tourist industry. Now, the, the farmers in the southern colonies, the southern states, uh, would come up with their families and spend, it in New spend their time in the summer in Newport. Right? At the same time, uh, the Newport merchants <coughs> would be making deals with them for either transporting their cotton or bringing it up here to be manufactured into cloth. Uh, they were getting, in the order of 500 visitors per week during the tourist season, social life was informal and, uh, you know, uh, the technology helped Newport's tourist industry because the steamships and the railroads made it easy to connect from Charleston and Savannah to New York and Newport. And the Fall River Line was bringing people up from uh, New York up through to Newport and they would get on the train and they would end up going up to Boston. The problem you got into is that we now these people, they're from the South, right? They're slave owners, they're running cotton, they're growing cotton. Civil War wiped that out, okay? Now, Bellevue Avenue in 1850 was a, was a dirt road. And you could buy land on Bellevue Avenue at $300 an acre, all right? Land speculators moved in. They bought it for three to $400 per acre and 1853, they were selling it for $2,000 to $5,000 an acre, right? Now, this came out of the city documents, so it's, it's reasonably good. Up until the Civil War, it was a mixed population of upper middle class and both the South and the North. In many cases, the heads of the family would be in business with each other. Uh, they opened a hotel, Bellevue Hotel opened on St. Catherine Street. Atlantic Hotel opened on Bellevue and Ocean House opened on Bellevue. 
What about clipper ships going to China? Say again? Clipper ships going to China. They had some... That, they were doing that uh, before the War of 1812. That's where they were making their, their China runs and the Baltic runs. Uh, during the War of 1812, uh, the British ran a blockade on Newport and caught those ships coming back. It, that, that trade more or less collapsed. Uh, this is a picture of the Ocean House. Now, conclusions. The, the occupation by the British, 1776 to 79, stopped the trade, caused a, chased away a lot of prominent merchants, but it didn't do any major damage to the town's infrastructure. Oh, it did do, sorry. Uh, it did not change the trading environment. Uh, as long as everybody was using wooden ships, right, and there was no overland transportation, things were pretty good for Newport. Uh, Newport recovered and was back in the international trading business by 1801. <coughs> what, wasn't uh, Newport sort of a center of piracy, uh, too? Uh? <laughs> The <laughs> was the center of pretty much anything. Uh, there were yes, <clears throat> there were people uh, running ships in Newport that uh, were considered privateers, depending on which side of the war you were on, and pirates if you weren't. And some of them decided they were still going to be privateers even though the war was over, which made them pirates by everybody's, you know, say so. Uh, what happened basically is that people from, from uh, Providence gained a significant advantage in the way they were manufacturing goods there and the merchants traded it out and uh, it just put Newport out of the, out of the trading business. Uh, the uh, person who coined this thing, the Joseph Schrumpeter, he a, was a, a professor of economics at Harvard, but basically it's that the new thing comes in, all the customers desert the old thing for the new thing, the people who are doing the old thing go out of business. Uh, capitalistic systems get changed from the inside. Uh, new goods, new market methods. Uh, Slater Mill was the start of the Newport's problem. Once, once Slater Mill and the northern part of Rhode Island started in its industrial revolution, Newport was in bad trouble. Uh, the difficulty with Newport is you can't get to it. Right? Once you get away from travel by ship, right, you got, you got, if you got somebody coming down from Providence, He's got to come across either Mount Hope, or he's got to come across from Tiverton, and then he's got to come down the island, then he's got to go over to Jamestown on a ferry, and then from Jamestown to Narragansett on a ferry. Uh, whereas somebody in Providence, he wants to go to New York, he gets on a train, <laughs> goes down the coast. So it's a very hard place to get to. Second, there's no water resources, no water power on the island, right? So they were limited. Until they started getting steam engines, all right, which were manufactured in Providence, by the way, steam engines, they couldn't run their factories. And then they had to bring the coal in. You notice all the factories that were built, they were making either cotton or woolen cloth were down on Thames Street. And the reason for it was that they had to run on coal. The only way you can get coal to them is to bring it in by barge or ship. Right? So uh, they were at a competitive disadvantage because you, you go up to Providence, uh, you got water power. You don't have to bring coal. You don't have to ship it. it it's, uh, you know? So it was a problem. And then the Providence merchants just competed them out of business. Uh, <sighs> Nupa just couldn't change because it didn't have the resources. Hmm? So when did they get into the into the the, uh, the tourist business? I mean, when did when did the you know look at the houses that New Yorkers going yeah. up and all that? 
when did all that start? Uh, basically, after the War of 1812, what, uh, in that time frame, what was happening is that uh, the uh, rich people in, this, in the southern states where they were manufacturing or growing cotton and other things, where they, where they had trading uh, relationships with the merchants in Newport, uh, they bring their families up here in the sp in, um, spring, go through the summer, in the fall they go back south. And uh, you know, this is a nice place to, to sit out the hot summer in, in Savannah or like that. So that's basically how it started. Uh, the Civil War put an end to that because those people no longer had any money. Uh, and then the people from New York who were making all their money on railroads and whatever, uh, started get, keeping an eye on Newport. And Newport is a nice place. Uh, it's not crowded. It's not hot. It's uh, relatively cool in, this, in the summer compared to these places. And so they decided this was a nice place to have their summer homes and, and moved, the, moved their people out of New York and wherever else they were. Uh, it turns out that the people from New York came up into Newport and built their houses out of stone. The people from Philadelphia, who were rich, moved up to Jamestown and built their houses out of wood. There are very few of those wooden houses left in Jamestown. Uh, there's a lot of stone structures left over at, uh, at Newport. Uh, the, uh, the beneficiary right now of, of uh, a lot of that stone structure is uh, South Virginia University. Most of their big buildings are leftover mansions that, that were donated to them and converted over to the school. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, anyway, more of 1812 um, and, and its aftermath really put a, put a finishing touch to Newport. Uh, oh yeah, backwards. Yeah. British occupation, you know, did not finish Newport. Industrial Revolution, Rhode Island finished Newport. 